terminology, <coughs> I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Hesong Ye. You know, I don't pronounce more like Ye rather than Li. Okay. And uh, any characters are written up here. So Dr. Ye got his PhD from Wisconsin in 2005 and then spent terms at uh, Florida University <coughs> and the University of Rivers uh, UC, UC Riverside and then Brookhaven. And uh, since 2002, he's been at William and Mary and with joint appointment at Jefferson Lab. So his title is Dark Horse and Bright Prospects. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to talk about the dark age in erection or the dark horse and its bright prospects. Since this is a job talk, I would think it might be appropriate to start with the overview of my career in the research area before my main talk about the dark horse. So as I introduced, I got my PhD in theoretical particle physics in 2005 at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And afterwards, I did several years of the postdoc as I introduced. Currently, I belong to the William and Mary and Jefferson Lab, and I will talk about the Jefferson Lab physics later in my talk. Through my PhD study and postdoc years, I have worked with many leading experts on broad range of topics in theoretical particle physics, and they include my own advisor, Vernon Barker at Madison, Human Davodius at Brookhaven, Paul Langaka at UPenn, Ernest Ma at UC Riverside, and Bill Marciano, Eddie Mafatia, Constantin Machel, Mark Shaw, Amari Sony, and many other people. I have published 32 papers in refereed journals, gathering more than 1,200 citations. And I have given 49 presentations at various international meetings and seminars. And for teaching, I have total eight semesters of experience as a teaching assistant in general physics. And in most semesters, I've covered both discussions and labs. For the community service, I have reported for several journals since 2006. And I helped ECPA, the Association of Korean Physicists in America, as a webmaster and newsletter team. And currently, I'm an auditor of the organization. So my research area is the theoretical particle physics, especially the phenomenology of the new physics, the understanding model. In particle physics, the new physics typically means you add a new particle on top of the standard model particles. And the reason we think about the new particle is because there are various theoretical and experimental issues you can address with the new particle or the new physics. My research topics are very broad, and they include the physics of Higgs boson, neutrinos, supersymmetric particles, New heavy gauge boson, fourth generation fermions, dark horse carrier, and dark matter. Especially this dark horse is one of the topics I have focused in the recent years, so this will be the subject of today's main talk. Okay, dark horse. One fact established by now is that we live in a dark world. More, uh, about three quarters of the whole universe energy is composed of dark energy, and more than 20% is composed of dark metal, and only about 4% of the universe energy is composed of the standard model particles. There are simply too many evidences to deny this picture, including the galaxy rotation curve, gravitational lens, cosmic microwave background, accelerating universe, and many other independent observations that support this picture. So it's quite established that there is a dark world. But there are still some astrophysical data that cannot be explained by this simple picture of the dark energy plus dark matter. And among them is the positron excess over the theoretical prediction. These picture shows the three uh, different satellite measurements of the positron. This is the Fermi, the blue is the Pamela, red is the AMS O2. 
the details are a little different from each other, but uh, they consistently indicate there are more positrons than the theoretical estimation. And they cannot be explained by this simple picture, so it suggests that we are missing something in our picture. That's why the dark force was introduced. The dark force is the force among the dark matters, and it can make the dark matter physics much dynamic. And with the dark force, one can address various puzzles, including the positron exists. So why, why is there only a positron axis in the surface given range around 10, you know, 100 GeV, but then you kind of tear off like afterwards? Uh, or is it because of resolution of the detectors or what? The, I don't know the details, but the, what I understand, what I heard is that Pamela actually shows the cutoff from somewhere here, but the real experiments uh, leave the possibility that it might just go on forever. I mean, there's no clear that clear end line except for Pamela. So each experiment is actually a little bit different, but the, but the one thing clear is that they overall uh, much more than the theoretical position. They are not, they are, they are consistent or they are not? I mean, if you call this consistent, I mean, you, you can see the error bars. So, uh -huh. uh, well, there is some difference between the Fermi, for example, from the AMSO2, uh, but the, just I'm just saying that each experiment from the standard model shows the deviation, but the, from each experiment, they are, there is a little difference. So which one do you really believe depends on uh, your taste or which collaboration you really believe, etc. They show some, some difference, but not, the, but not at the level to say that there is no positron excess. So that's not what you're working on? Um, I'm not exactly working on with the astrophysical data, okay. but uh, some new physics is uh, some new physics model is motivated from the positron excess. I'm basically working on that new physics. The presence of the dark force means the presence of the dark force carrier. And let me call this dark force carrier G prime. Uh, just because the, just like the standard model, G boson, the G prime is also a massive particle and electrically neutral. So what's the reason for this to be in GeV scale? Good question. Um, one of the reason is that um, we have seen the positron excess, but not the anti-proton excess. So if the G prime mass is much larger than a few GeV, then it should give the anti-proton excess too, but it does not. So. I'm not trying to say that this is the only possibility to explain this. Well, but the thing is that, like, that whether it's having, having an excess or not, they kind of get blurred right, over the you know higher energy scale. That will affect what the assumption of you have for the boson, <coughs> for the boson mass you have, right? So I'm I'm just curious. I mean, what is that the right? Um, the energy scale here actually uh, tells you more about the dark matter scale, okay. not the dark force boson scale. Not the dark force scale. So you're saying, if I understand what you're saying, the dark force scale was to do with the, the fact you only see positron axis, but not, not other axis, not, not, not anti-proton axis right. in, the, in this data. But this data does not show the anti-proton axis. It just shows the positron axis. Right, so is the resolution good enough to tell you whether you have the anti-proton axis or not? Um, <coughs> it is good enough to say that there's no anti-proton excess. That is my understanding. And, and that is why you, people you try to model to explain this phenomenon. And therefore you were saying it's okay to have a one GV scale boson that can do this stuff. Um, one GV boson can explain why there's positron excess without the anti-proton excess. But I'm not trying to say that's the only possibility to explain. That's your model. That's not my model. Oh, okay. oh I see. Okay. <laughs> but I have a similar model. <laughs> I, I will talk about it. Okay. Okay. Um, that's a good discussion. So, as I said, <laughs> it is supposed to be about order of 1 GB, which is the same scale as the proton mass. 
And mm -hmm. although it can have a sizable coupling to the dark matter, it should have extremely weak couplings to the standard matter particles. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this light particle should have been discovered already. So this picture shows the galaxy and the dark matter. The entire galaxy is within the dark matter halo. And when the dark matter is annihilated through this dark force gauge version G prime to the positron and the electron pairs, they can explain this positron excess and also some other anomaly. <coughs> it is studied by Akari Hamid et al. and many other people. So we have the dark trilogy, meaning the dark world <coughs> is composed of dark energy, dark matter, and dark force. And the dark force is the focus of this talk. So there are many ongoing and proposed searches for the dark force in the labs around the world. And you can see some of them here. A particularly attractive feature about the dark force is it is one of the rare new physics scenarios that can be tested with low energy experimental facilities, which are typically for the nuclear or the hegemonic physics. And this is, of course, possible because the dark force period G prime is the GeV scale, which is about 1,000 times smaller than the typical new physics scale, which is the TeV scale. So if a new particle is the TeV scale, the LHC is practically the only place to find it. But since this is about the proton mass scale, you can use a lot of low energy experiments to search for this. Searching for dark force period is the search for new fundamental force. And we know each and every fundamental force made a huge impact in our understanding of the physical world. So the discovery of another <coughs> fundamental force will do the exactly the same thing and will probably bring the revolutionary effects in our lives. So this is the outline for the rest of my talk. Uh, we'll first take a look at the dark force models, and we'll, think of, uh, we'll discuss the dark force searches in the low energy experiments, and briefly discuss its implication for the LHC, uh, connecting the low energy physics and the high energy physics. Okay, dark force model. So we need to extend the standard model to include the dark force. It means in this list of force carriers, the photon, gluon, G and W, we need to add the G prime, the dark force carrier, of order of one GV. The gauge symmetry of the standard model is now extended by another gauge symmetry, typically U1, <coughs> or the U1 dark. And the U1 dark may interact with the dark matter but the standard mother particles have zero charges under this muon dark. So the G prime, the gauge version of this muon dark gauge symmetry, does not have a direct coupling to the standard mother particles. But the G prime can still couple to the standard mother particles through the kinetic mixing of the muon hypercharge and the muon dark. The muon hypercharge is one of the standard mother gauge symmetry, and this is the kinetic term of the muon hypercharge. And this is the kinetic term of the yuan dark. And this is the kinetic mixing term of the two yuans. And this kinetic mixing is parameterized by this epsilon uh, with some normalization factor. So through this kinetic mixing, uh, the G prime can mix with the standard model gauge version. And the, through this mixing with the standard model gauge version, now the G prime can couple to the standard model formulas. I'm very dumb question. How do we know it's a yuan? We don't. It's just simplest possibility, and it's just very interesting. Well, that's going to have a very different behavior if it's a U1 or an LOB. It is. But therefore, the coupling you are calculating is going to have a very different behavior. Yes. But we have to pick one and study it before we go to the other one. That's the nature of all the understanding of the <laughs> physics as well. Uh, the G prime coupling to the standard model particles are suppressed by the small mixing, but the exact couplings are model dependent. So the popular model is often called the dark photon uh, because its coupling is proportional to the photon coupling, 
with a separation factor epsilon. And this separation factor epsilon is the same parameter of the kinetic missing here. And uh, there is a relatively new model by my collaborators and myself. And we call this dark G because uh, in this model, the coupling is extended to include a G boson coupling with a new parameter epsilon G. So diagrammatically, uh, in the dark photon model, the G prime mixes only with a photon. But in the dark G model, it mixes with a photon and also the G boson. So the, because of this G coupling, uh, it inherits some properties of the G boson such as parity violation of the G boson. So it means the different couplings for the left-handed particle and the right-handed particle to the G prime. And because of this coupling, uh, you can see the dark photon is, in some sense, heavier version of the photon. And the dark G is a lighter version of the G boson. Uh, we are not going to uh, discuss the technical part of this slide, but I'd like to mention a model dependence in the coupling and it comes from how the G prime gets the mass or the detailed the Higgs sector. For example, if the G prime gets a mass from Higgs singlet, it is the dark photon and its coupling is proportional to the photon coupling. But if the G prime gets a mass from Higgs doublet, it's a dark G and the coupling is the combination of the photon coupling and the G coupling. So the bottom line is the dark force coupling depends on the Higgs sector. The effect of the new model is that the parameter space is basically extended from the 2D to 3D. In the original dark photon model, we need only two parameters, the G prime mass and the kinetic mixing angle, the epsilon. And in the dark G model, you need another uh, parameter, epsilon G, to describe the G and G prime mixing. So you can see the dark G is a dark photon with a more general coupling. In the dark, original dark photon model, is a special limit of the dark G when the epsilon G goes to zero. And of course, it's not just the number of parameter changes. It's the, there are some experiments which are irrelevant to the dark photon searches, which are now relevant to the dark G searches. And they include the low energy parity test, enhanced the flavor changing measure decays, rare Higgs decays, rare top decays, and uh, uh, they will be discussed later in this talk. <coughs> okay, the dark hole searches in the low energy experiments. <coughs> uh, this picture shows the mass of the G prime in the lower scale from about 3 MeV to the 1 GeV. And this is the kinetic mixing parameter epsilon squared. And this epsilon squared is same to the ratio of the dark photon coupling alpha prime over the uh, standard model photon coupling alpha. Um, and this, uh, uh, this is actually supposed to be green. Uh, this green band is quite an interesting parameter region because this can also explain the 3.6 sigma deviation in the muon G minus two through this uh, one of contribution of the G prime. So if the deviation is true, it could be a uh, early hint of the dark force. And these shaded regions indicate various bounds from various experiments. Uh, this is the electron G minus two, neon G minus two, and these are the uh, beam dump experiments from select Formulab, and OSE. And these are the major decays, especially the coconium type of decays, the BB bar, SS bar, and BB bar, they give this uh, shaded region. And the apex test and the MAMI are the fixed target experiments, which are the new experiments designed for direct dark photon searches. And the DJ uh, curves show the future fixed target experiment coverage, the <coughs> dark light, BEP3, uh, apex, HPS, and some of these experiments are the Jefferson lab experiments. So I'd like to talk about that. Um, the, 
Jefferson Lab was a jail lab it's located in Virginia, in the States. And this is mainly for the nuclear with the hadronic physics. But there are also three fixed target experiments to search for the dark force. Uh, this is the continuous electron beam. Um, and this continuous beam can be routed to three experimental holes, hole A, hole B, and hole C. And at hole A experiment, there's an apex experiment. At hole B, there's a heavy photon surge. And there is a free electron laser facility in this building, and there's a dark light experiment using this free <coughs> electron laser. So there are three experiments, and they all use the same method to search for the dark force. That's the dark photon Bremsch problem. So the idea is you use the electron beam to hit a fixed target with a high atomic number. Then the, some of the kinetic energy of the electron can convert into the radiation energy, mostly to the photon, but some of them are possibly dark photon if it exists. The dark photon is a massive particle, which means it can decay into E plus E minus pair. So if you look at the invariant mass plot of the E plus E minus, you can find the bump in the plot if the dark, if the dark photon exists. So this is basically the direct bump searches of the dark force. Now we want to discuss the effect of the dark G model. Uh, let me skip the technical part again, but uh, I'd like to mention the dark G effect comes as the modification of the effective Lagrangian of the neutral current phenomenon. So this is the weak neutral current, another weak neutral current, and Q is the momentum transfer between the two neutral currents when there is a scattering. And uh, what happens is this dark G effect changes the weak neutral current but only for the low momentum transfer. And what it means in reality is that if you look at the, if you use the low Q squared polarized electron scattering, which measures the parity violation in the low Q squared, you can search for the dark force. So uh, you can uh, get a cross-section of the left-handed polarized electron and the right-handed polarized electron and the difference of the two scattering can give you the information about the parity. And using that information of the parity at the low Q squared, uh, one can search for this uh, dark G gauge uh, buzzer. And at the Jefferson lab, there are two such uh, low Q squared polarized electron scattering experiments. The proposed Moller experiment at hole A and the ongoing QIG experiment at hole C. So on top of the three existing experiments, now, we have two more experiments at the Jefferson lab alone uh, to search for the dark force. The JLab QIG and the Moller experiments were originally proposed as an economic way for the precision test of the standard model parity violation. But the, our works in 2012 first pointed out these low Q-scale polarized electron scattering experiments can be used such for certain type of dark, dark force. Okay, so this is the uh, major item of equipment, equipment proposal of the Jefferson Lab Moller experiment, which is kind of the follow-up proposal for the DOE. And you can see that in this section, uh, they're discussing our model dark G. And this is our plot. Um, this is the momentum transfer Q in the log scale. And this is the Weinberg angle, which measures the parity violation. This black curve is the standard model prediction. And this shaded region is the possible deviation due to the dark G. And one interesting fact in this plot is that this deviation appears only in the very low Q. I mean, this is the 1 GB, and you can see the deviation only below the 1 GB. And this deviation never appears in the high energy experiments like electro wing or the heat scale. In other words, <coughs> you need a low energy experiment to see this deviation. So using our work, the Moller collaboration 
which is the low energy penalty test, argues their unique sensitivity to a certain kind of new physics. Another kind of dark force searches are using the measurement decays. And the typical dark force searches in measurement decays are performed only in the flavor of conserving ones, the QQ bar type of measurement. So BB bar, SS bar, and BB bar, they can all decay into the dark force, dark force energy prime, and they give it a bound like these ones. So BABA is the BB bar, CRO is SS bar, and the COSI is the BB bar. But there are also flavor changing decays, like B2S using the W loop. And in the dark photo model, uh, this is very small because first this is already loop suppressed, and the coupling is suppressed by the small epsilon. So we can expect only a rather small branch ratio for the dark photo model. But in the dark G model, this is also loop suppressed, and the coupling is suppressed by the epsilon Z but there is an enhancement factor in this model for the boost energy prime. So we have a much bigger branch ratio. And this the origin of this enhancement factor is basically the Goldstone version equivalent theorem that applies to the axial coupling, which dark she has, but the dark button does not. So unlike the dark photon, uh, as this uh, uh, illustration shows, the dark G predicts potentially much large branch ratios. So the fine beam search uh, for the dilepton bump in the flavor changing measurement decays uh, have a very good potential to discover the dark force like B2KG prime and the K2KG prime. So the dark photon model is very Okay, so, so far we have overviewed the dark force such as in the low energy labs. There are many uh, searches, and uh, some of theoretical contributions were made by my collaborators and myself. And the dark force is one of the very rare new physics that can be directly and indirectly detected in the low energy experiments. So naturally, with the attention from these low energy labs, the dark force search is becoming a very big industry. So now we want to briefly discuss its implications for the LHC experiment, connecting the low energy physics uh, to the high energy physics. This is the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC, in Geneva area. Uh, it has very large size, 27 kilometer circumference. Uh, it takes a lot of cost and manpower to construct and operate. And the standard model like Higgs boson was discovered at the LHC experiment in 2012. So last year, uh, Franz Engelert and the Peter Higgs got the Nobel Prize for their direct work. Uh, once a new particle is discovered, the next step is the precision study of this new particle, including the detailed decay mode. And the Higgs boson can decay into the dark force carrier in the standard model, the Higgs can decay to G and G if the mass is large enough. And because of this G, G prime mixing in the dark G model, Higgs can decay to G and the G prime. So we required our signal, the Higgs to G, G prime, and eventually mm -hmm. to four leptons. And you can take the two leptons and the reconstruct the G prime event like this. The major standard model background is the G gamma star, this red one, and the Higgs to GG star, this black one. And you can see this signal peak is clearly outstanding over the standard model background. So you can use the LHC experiment to search for the dark force. So do we see such a peak in the actual experiment so far? You might if you do the analysis, but they did not do the analysis yet. But in the LHC experiment, it all depends on your analysis scheme, whether you can see 